I think it is clear to believe in the power of ideas. Fresh thank you to the Manhattan Institute. I'll get your attention, please. I'd like to, uh, we're going to conclude our, our uh, program today with uh, a talk from uh, Ed Morse, who, uh, whose bi biographical sketch that you have in your, uh, in your packets. I just want to say by way of a very brief introduction, so, Ed can, so you can hear Ed talk, that uh, two things about Ed. He's, uh, unlike many analysts, and I don't mean this as a slight against of all, all of our, my colleagues who have talked today, He's willing to not equivocate, and he'll call something. Of course, he has to in his business. He'll make a call. I think you'll hear some of the calls he's going to make about the future. He also, uh, I, I give Ed credit for being un, uh, one of the earliest, most insightful analysts on how the world has changed and how the U.S. has changed out there, period. There are lots of people who study this field. Few are as uh, thorough uh, and accurate and interesting as Ed. And he was one of the very first to call it and call it right when people were saying either Soto voice or directly to him that they thought that he was a little bit nuts about uh, how bullish he was about what was going to happen some time ago. Uh, and he, he published uh, over a year ago a great report about the, the new Middle East, which became a new phrase for, for America. Uh, brilliant guy, interesting guy. He, but the, the interesting thing why I was hoping he would come and join us is that he's one of the few guys that's ahead of the curve and been right. Most forecasters are wrong, and they don't get dinged for being wrong. Except if you're an investment forecaster, that's different. But in the energy world, you don't get dinged for being wrong, you just keep being an expert and talking. Ed's been right. So what, when you hear Ed talk and talk about where things are going, you may disagree with him, but the odds are, in my opinion, Ed's right. So with that, Ed, please. Thank you. Anybody who's been looking at markets for as long as I have have certainly been wrong from time to time. Uh, and you learn from your lessons, and maybe sometimes you learn to be bold when you need to be bold. I, I'm sorry I missed a good bit of the discussion this morning, but uh, I thought I was, uh, it might be useful to uh, start just by way of introduction to the, to the set of ideas I want to share with you today. Uh, start with the, the way we deal with our habits about thinking about the world and how rapidly those habits can change and how reluctant we are sometimes to really face the fact that our assumptions might be wrong and our, that our habits in thinking about things might have to change. It wasn't very long ago. It was uh, probably around 2010 that I still, uh, when I woke up in the morning and I thought about the, uh, the business at hand, I thought that uh, the markets were going to get tighter and tighter. I thought the U.S. was going to see its consumption continuing to grow. The U.S. was going to see its production of hydrocarbons continuing to decline. I thought that uh, prices were going to go up, and I thought that uh, the finding costs for finding new hydrocarbons were going to continue to rise as they did some 650 percent between 2003 and 2008. And now, uh, when I get up and I think about the business at hand, every one of those assumptions has a very different direction to it. I think uh, the U.S. is going to continue to see its consumption decline, if not decline dramatically. I think uh, the production base hasn't seen anything yet, uh, even as Adam Siminski and the Wall Street Journal celebrate uh, the notion that in July the U.S. overtook Russia as the largest hydrocarbon producing country uh, in the world. Uh, Prices are almost certainly going to be retreating at some point in time. That point in time uh, is almost certainly going to be by the end of the decade. There will be some uh, bumpy roads ahead because the amount of, uh, amount of hydrocarbons, oil in particular, and disruption uh, has grown significantly from around the half a million barrels a day uh, at any given moment in time before the uh, Libyan disruption in February 2011 to over three and a half million barrels a day this past month and probably still hovering close to three million barrels a day 
propping up prices uh, at a level that they otherwise might not be. It's not just those perceptions about how we think about where markets are heading uh, tomorrow that have changed considerably, uh, but it's also uh, patterns that are lingering uh, about what American security is all about uh, and what American security should be all about. And in that regard, there are a lot of people in the U.S. who are uh, contemplating having conferences on the theme of energy independence. There is a, a notorious such conference taking place in Washington on October 16th, the 40th anniversary of the Arab oil embargo. And I, I think it's worth thinking for a minute also about the mindset that most of us have had uh, and that still lingers coming from the aftermath of the Arab oil embargo. Uh, the Arab oil embargo was an effort by Arab oil producing countries to take action uh, against any country that was in support of Israel in the aftermath of the blitzkrieg attack on Israel by all of the Arab countries surrounding it and even those uh, who were in the neighborhood but did not uh, abut territorially uh, Israel. That was the use of an oil weapon. It was a very politicized effort to change the nature uh, of the oil business and it really did so. And just to remind ourselves of what the world was like uh, before the Arab oil embargo took place, whether you liked them or not, the international oil majors, the so-called seven sisters, did a pretty good job of keeping uh, consumer prices low. They did a pretty good job of finding and developing new supply. They did a pretty good job of not having any volatility in price in the market. They managed to supply the entire world, the exception being uh, the Soviet Union, but that had some other elements to it. They managed to supply the entire world without thinking about any discrimination against the ethnic background of a country or a company that they were supplying, without thinking about the color uh, of the nation when it comes to international politics. And what, what succeeded that world, uh, which was a win-win world, was uh, a world turned upside down in many ways. And uh, it was a world that was not a win-win world, but a, a I win, you lose world from the perspective of oil producing countries. A perspective, by the way, which still lingers uh, in the policy framework of not only the entire OPEC community, but other oil producing uh, countries as well. And uh, I'll talk a little bit about that uh, in a minute. It was. Uh, the largest transfer of wealth in the history of the world in uh, one fell swoop with the nationalization uh, of oil industry property, triggering a uh, massive desire on the part of everybody in the business to develop inventory. So inventory build had apparent demand rising some 400 percent while actual demand was totally stagnant. It uh, created uh, a mindset in Washington that forms energy security, lingers in energy security to today. And the reason I'm bringing it up is because I do want to talk about energy independence and what it might mean. But from the minute that that uh, embargo was imposed in October 1973, uh, the US adopted a policy of we will not allow any embargoes. We will defang anybody's effort to use oil as an instrument of policy. One that didn't quite work, but that was the direction of it. Uh, we're not going to uh, either allow anyone to disrupt intentionally or have disruptions unintentionally because we're going to build a very large strategic stockpile which currently sits at some 700 million barrels, more than ample for our days of forward demand cover, let alone our days of forward uh, import cover. Uh, and we set up an institution, the IEA, uh, to prevent uh, the OPEC countries from using oil as an instrument, withholding favors from some uh, consuming countries and providing favors uh, to those who offered arms, offered boats in the UN. Uh, we tried to depoliticize what was happening. And the reason all of that is important is because while that mindset still prevails, and it certainly underlies the entire uh, anti-debate when it comes to the question of should the United States export oil, uh, it is really mindfully wrong uh, because the world that is emerging is one which for the first time since 1973 really does allow us to think through what the underlying nature of an energy sector could be, where there are win-win solutions, not win-lose solutions, 
uh, in which uh, markets can play the role in pricing to do what was turned on its head uh, by that Arab oil embargo, which enabled OPEC uh, countries thereafter uh, to change the nature of commodity markets. In all other commodity markets, we tend to have the lowest cost production serving the market first, and as prices warrant, we bring online marginal uh, fields, we bring online more costly production, and that's how the market balances. This is a world that's just the opposite of a well-functioning market world. Uh, it's a world which, by the way, is the largest single part of the global economy, both by the volume of trade and the value of trade and the volume and value of international investment flows. And yet it's one whose underlying uh, dictum has been, let's keep the cheapest oil in the ground and let's use the most expensive one, because that way the rentier state can really emerge. And that is the final, uh, actually, legacy of 1973 that I want to mention right now. It created the rentier states that are currently under attack. It created the theft of national wealth by very small leadership groups, whether democratically elected or not, uh, whether through corruption or through uh, monarchical, monarchical lineage. Uh, but it set the groundwork for what's really unfolding in not just the MENA region today, but in Venezuela and uh, in uh, Nigeria and other oil producing or gas producing countries where wealth uh, accumulation has been in the hands of a very small group of people and where Vox Populi reigns, whether they're democracies or not, where they want some part of uh, whatever is available for their own good as opposed to the good of the rulers. This is what uh, the stakes are in my mind when it comes to uh, the debate over energy independence. And when it comes to energy independence, uh, the numbers and the projections are really quite clear. North America, the United States, Mexico, and Canada linked together by a free trade agreement, uh, also having a nice uh, anniversary this year. Uh, those three states are going to be combined net exporters of hydrocarbons, and they will be combined net exporters of hydrocarbons pretty soon. Uh, and if there's any debate about what is happening, it's really what the volume is going to be and where they're from. Uh, and even if we tend to think, some of us, that the U.S. might not be a net uh, exporter of oil, it certainly will be an exporter of Canadian oil because Canadian oil will be coming to the northern border and exiting from the southern border, and it will happen really soon. It will probably, the stage will set for it to happen uh, actually uh, in the fourth quarter of this year. So uh, it's upon us. It's the fourth quarter where, uh, as we know, the Keystone uh, XL Pipeline Southern uh, leg is now uh, in the process of line fill. Uh, and when the line fill gets going, uh, it's going to have the same magical impact on investment opportunities in uh, Canada as the Seaway and other pipelines have had in the United States, because just as WTI spreads have shrunk from $20 a barrel to closer to parity during, during the course of this year, the spread between the Canadian main benchmark, WCS, and WTI currently over $30 a barrel will be no more than 15 by the end of the year and probably nine uh, by uh, the end of the first quarter of next year. So it's, the Canadian oil will be there. It will affect uh, a, a lot of things. Surely there will be a debate as, uh, and it will get hotter and hotter as the surpluses of crude oil keep uh, accumulating on the U.S. Gulf Coast. I think the debate on American energy independence has been a false debate uh, run by or dominated by people who don't understand how markets operate, uh, but rather dominated by people who wave a banner and state the obvious. Energy independence, they say, will not make U.S. consumers uh, significantly less vulnerable to uh, price spikes. They may actually be partly wrong on that, but yes, that's true. Uh, a country that is integrated into the global economy where the price at home is influenced by the price abroad and the price abroad is influenced by the price at home, uh, the nature of economic interdependence is such that we will not be uh, less vulnerable. And the second flag, the banner that they wave in saying this is a stupid idea, uh, is the, the flag that says that uh, we still will be, in, we'll still have national security interests in the Middle East. Well, of course we'll still have national security uh, interests in the Middle East. The U.S. From the U.S. perspective, security is a global phenomenon. It doesn't stop at the national borders. The U.S. Uh, has a, 
a vested interest forever uh, in the nature of uh, global flows, in the nature uh, of sea lanes, in the nature and growth potential of the world economy. The interest of the Middle East is a very different issue from intentions to deploy forces for whatever reason here and there. But uh, energy independence really does have a palpable gain. Uh, and it has a palpable gain both on the oil side and the natural gas side. And it does so whether in a, tr in a strictly uh, limited way the U.S. is a net exporter uh, of crude oil. The U.S. will be a net exporter of hydrocarbons, for sure. The U.S. has already moved in the last three years from being the largest importer of petroleum products in the world to the largest exporter of petroleum products in the world. On a net basis, we're number two to Russia. Uh, on a gross basis, we will beat Russia out as the largest source of petroleum products going to global markets. Uh, uh, they're not quite global because we don't export and we're not likely to export much in the way of product from uh, the West Coast, but uh, product as defined by traditional products, the four big ones, including gasoline and diesel. And gasoline, by the way, we are net exporters half the year now uh, for uh, fuel oil, for jet fuel, uh, and also for the array of NGLs, uh, including, uh, obviously, propane and butane, uh, propane, pentane pluses, and even ethane, which never could be exported, people said, uh, is now uh, under a term contract for export from the United States to Europe as the cheapest uh, petrochemical feedstock uh, available uh, in the world, other than Qatar, maybe, uh, and it will uh, not be as quite as low as it is in the U.S., but it will be in the, in, in the world. So the U.S. W will be not necessarily fully integrated, I hope fully integrated, into the world system. And I think it's important to think about what that means. It means that for the first time there is a pole in the global energy markets where markets really count and a supplier of significance uh, where long-term supply really counts. And it will be the only big supplier where pricing is done entirely by markets and not done by something uh, involving some form of, uh, of uh, political intervention. So I, I gave you the dimensionality of gross product exports uh, from the U.S. Uh, I think it's fair to say that other, if you combine the product side and uh, projected increases in production in the United States, in Canada and Mexico, uh, there could be as much as five million barrels a day uh, of exportable capacity coming out of the three North American countries. I think that's a reasonably conservative number. Uh, and in just in terms of world supply, that's more oil than Russia exports and less oil than Saudi Arabia exports. Uh, so the U.S. would be the second largest, all other things being equal, uh, exporter uh, of oil. What's happening on the oil side is happening on the gas side. And, um, and let's look at reasonable projections of uh, authorized LNG exports fr coming from the U.S., and I'll turn back to uh, oil then in a minute to uh, bring the argument full circuit. Uh, we have uh, so far licensed, or not fully licensed, but approved uh, just about six BCF a day uh, of uh, natural gas exports in a what's currently a 69 BCF a day market. Uh, I think it's reasonable to assume that by uh, the end of this year or early, early next year, uh, there will be under licensing 10 BCF a day of uh, LNG exports. They start uh, in the export system in 2015 uh, and grow all 10 BCF a day. That should be in the global market within five years of the first cargoes being exported. Uh, 10 BCF a day is 70, 77 million tons per year of LNG, the U.S. would exceed Qatar as the largest LNG exporting country in the world. Uh, Russia is a massive uh, exporting country. Uh, Russia has been a European lumpy supplier using uh, uh, price and availability as an instrument of diplomacy. Uh, Russia is moving to becoming a global uh, supplier uh, of hydrocarbons, the European market is very important to Russia. We know from anecdotal reading of newspapers that uh, the Russians uh, frequently have been seen withhold, withholding supply 
uh, because of frictions they have uh, with countries through which pipelines transit. Imagine yourself being a buyer of oil on a free trade basis or not from the United States, and you're in Europe, or a buyer of natural gas on an LNG basis from Qatar. Uh, and one of the calculations you make is what's the price of the commodity? Is it a market principle or is it a non-market principle? But another one is what is the long-term security of that supply line? And if you were a buyer of the commodity, uh, and by the way, we can now say that we know of such a, a buyer because the same European pet, pet chem company that has undertaken contracts for ethane by ship from the Port of Philadelphia is looking to get Henry Hub priced natural gas from the United States into the United Kingdom. Uh, and it's doing so uh, for uh, the same reason others will, namely American supply is not Russian supply. And the rules of the game are very different, both in terms of pricing, not linked to oil, linked to gas on gas com competition and not linked to political restrictions. So think about security of supply in general from the Middle East. Would you rather have a uh, incremental or even a base load supply of LNG coming from the United States or would you rather have it coming uh, from a capital of a country that's on the other side of the Strait of Hormuz? So for s significant geopolitical reasons, I think market reinforcement uh, will be taking place. I think we those of us who care about the subject, uh, and I know this room is filled with some of the most articulate proponents uh, of uh, oil exports uh, that I know of in the United States, but the fact of the matter is that uh, if we exported freely crude oil, the price of gasoline would be cheaper in this country than it would be if we don't. Uh, and uh, there are a whole bunch of reasons for that. One of them is the world price of oil would be lower than it otherwise might, might be. Another is that if you look at the alternative ways we dispose of oil, we have uh, laws on the books that make it exceedingly difficult to export uh, gasoline from the U.S. Gulf Coast to either the U.S. West Coast or the U.S. East Coast. So the gasoline exports that I talked about going to Latin America, including Venezuela, to uh, Brazil, even, even to uh, countries in Europe that used to be long gasoline and now short gasoline. Um, we can't do the same by shipping from Texas and Louisiana to Philadelphia because the restrictions on U.S. flag bottoms run by or people by U.S. labor uh, in a world where our national security laws uh, are designed to uh, enable us to preserve a merchant range fleet, and of course we have no mer merchant marine fleet because the U.S. flag vessels are not competitive. So I, I think I've, I've uh, said enough uh, for at least the time being. I'm happy to pursue these discussions in whatever detail anyone wants, and uh, uh, I'll leave it open to questions. Unfortunately, you have the first question because you're the first person I see. Unfortunately, since I'm uh, moder moderating my own questions, I'm being blinded by these spotlights. And, uh, my focus might not be fully across the whole room, but yeah. When you talk about uh, petroleum exports and imports, it becomes confusing to a lot of people, perhaps myself included, um, because refined products versus crude. Do you see a, envision a time when, from a balance of payment standpoint, we petroleum hydrocarbons become a zero from a, right now we have a big deficit of I don't know, $400 billion a year. Do you see it at a point where it becomes zero? The, yeah, I do. Um, the, um, the largest component of the current account deficit is the net hydrocarbon import bill and that uh, has been shrinking it um, in terms of uh, GDP it has an impact, and in terms of the current account deficit, it has an impact. Just in terms of the current account deficit, uh, all other things being equal, and I'm always reminded that things are never equal, but you've got to start the argument that way, two-thirds of the current account deficit today would be eliminated. Uh, and then the debate gets really interesting, because uh, the debate on where it goes, if assume we have a zero balance on the current account, uh, is what happens to the propensity of Americans to buy imported goods as, um, uh, as the 
as national income rises and per capita income rises, and what happens with industrial structure. So the fact is that there is an, a significant impact on industrial structure at the same time that there's a significant impact on the current account deficit. Uh, and I, I recognize that you've got to get a dynamic model that will calculate what the value of the dollar is against a, a, a set of other countries. But the feedstock issue swamps everything. So, you know, we, we are exporting ethane for the first time ever. And there's never in the history of the world been uh, non-pipeline exports of ethane. And the only pipeline uh, exports of ethane have been to the United States, from the U.S. to Canada. It's not, you know, important, but not world scale. Um, and that's because ethane, we have an abundance of ethane. We will have an abundance of ethane for a really long time. Uh, we currently uh, have a uh, slightly over a one million barrel a day ethane market and we're producing 1,200,000 barrels a day of ethane, and that number keeps rising. So the ethane needs to be put to use. It has very limited uses. One of the big uses is, uh, is in petrochemical cracking, so uh, ethylene cracking. Um, there are uh, nine announced, but probably six or seven, to be built uh, new ethylene uh, crackers in the United States. Almost all on the Gulf Coast may be one or two in Pennsylvania and, or Ohio. Um, the feedstock will be the cheapest in the world. It makes the U.S. petrochemical industry the most, petro the most competitive petrochemical industry in the world, regardless of any foreseeable uh, dollar-euro relationship. The, actually, the European petrochem industry is sort of hopeless on a, on a cost basis. On uh, other uses of methane, so we have been a net importer of fertilizers. We will be a net exporter of fertilizers on uh, subjects that uh, some of my friends in the room are uh, 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 do, namely or in the steel business or the U.S. You know, the, the fracking industry and the production business are incredibly steel intensive. They are incredibly tubularly uh, intensive, uh, bringing water uh, into uh, exploitation use is very tubular intensive. Uh, the U.S. tubular industry is fairly competitive on a global basis, and uh, making steel, which would require more significant uh, investment than has occurred so far, uh, using uh, natural gas as a replacement in whatever the process is for uh, met coal, uh, also makes that a significantly cheaper, uh, thank you very much, uh, cheaper uh, feedstock for, for that industry. So I hope I've answered, yeah. Um, as you think about um, looking forward uh, with the regards to the clearing price for natural gas yeah. in the United States, as North American production becomes more integrated in the world economy, one might think that prices abroad would tend down and prices domestically would trend up. How do you see that? Yeah, so Jared and anyone else who's from the world of the of press who's here, this is one thing that's not quotable because I haven't published on it, and uh, I don't know, I've modeled it, but I'm not allowed to be public in a way on things that have not been uh, fully published. So this this is an off the record part of whatever I'm saying. Um, it's it's a complex process to try to figure this out. There are several moving pieces. I, I the driver that I've gotten that that has driven me into trying to figure this out started with. Uh, the little puzzle. So we, uh, we had a significant surge in natural gas production uh, up until last year. Uh, and then uh, because the market has not responded on the demand side, the natural gas price started plummeting and producers moved wholesale from gas directional drilling to oil directional drilling. Uh, and yet our production keeps rising. So 50% drop in drilling and production is still growing. That's pretty remarkable. But the real question that I had, uh, and it's not an insignificant one, is what is the price at which drillers will go into drilling for gas again as opposed to oil? Because you, you, need, you need to, eventually, there won't be enough gas and the price will go up. And you need to find, it, find a, you know, what the trigger point is. And the trigger point is not just the, the price of gas, it's the gas oil price. So if we look at, uh, and I'm not going to do this in the complicated way of looking at BTU equivalents of a gas molecule and an oil molecule, but I'll do it in terms of simple stuff you can understand. At the wellhead, traditionally the price of oil 
uh, was seven times as dollars per barrel as the price of natural gas in dollars per million BTU. So if oil was 21, uh, the Henry Hub price would have been three. That six to one ratio at the wellhead is 33 to one today. So clearly, if you're producing, uh, if you're producing oil, it's a, a lot more remunerative, uh, even if oil is not fully getting a waterborne price. So, so the, the exercise started with that, and, um, and that led us to model the entire U.S. gas industry and the cost curve of the entire industry and to look at uh, where value is because, as uh, not everybody in this room knows, a, uh, a molecule of oil in the Eagleford in Texas, on average, uh, has a lot of other non-oily things in it, uh, and that's one of the reasons why our gas production keeps growing. So if, you're, if, you're, if you can make a profit on, gas, on oil in the Eagleford, if you paid somebody a dollar and a half per million BTU to take the gas away, uh, it's kind of a waste product and not a driver of what your underlying activity is. So, uh, so you've got to model that in on a cost curve basis for, for the entire country. And what we came up with uh, is the following rule. If, if, if WTI were selling at $90 per barrel, at an average 550 per million BTU price, a, uh, producer, a, a driller would be indifferent as to whether to drill for oil or drill for gas. Uh, now, I'm not going to tell you that that's an actually correct, but I think ballpark, I'm pretty pleased with, with, with that analysis. The, um, so that, that that's, sets a, uh, an interesting marker um, another, in which you'd get a lot of new directional drilling on the, on the gas side. The other interesting uh, thing to think about is what is an LNG market? How, how, does, how do the economics of the LNG market work? It actually now gets a little bit interesting and more complicated. One of, one of the main arguments of the uh, anti-market people who uh, were against LNG exports is that this is our gas, and if it's sold, it'll be more expensive. Uh, and the truth is we, we cohabit a uh, very uh, intricate network of pipelines in North America. So there is no distinction between the U.S. gas market and the Canadian gas market. In the period of time when our uh, gas production surged by uh, a little over 10 BCF a day, our imports from Canada collapsed. Uh, there's a lot of stranded gas in Canada. The, uh, the fact is that, you know, you get Marcellus, Pennsylvania, natural gas currently producing around 11 BCF a day on the entire Marcellus region. They weren't producing anything three, four years ago. So you've had 11 BCF a day, it's probably nine, pushed out by producers in Texas, Louisiana, Oklahoma. Uh, one artifact, by the way, of that is that gas storage on the U.S. Gulf Coast is at a record level. It's, people don't know what to do with it because there's uh, so much of it. Even if the, the nation as a whole doesn't have the superabundance of gas and storage, certainly in Texas and Louisiana, there's a superabundance in storage. So they, they've tried to find new markets, and they shoved the gas up pipelines, reverse pipelines, shoved it into uh, the Chicago region and other parts of the mid-continent, and shoved out Canadian gas. If we export more and more LNG, that gas will put relief on the Canadian producer. So just to give you a sense, if uh, Henry Hub gas, and I don't know what it's trading at this morning, let's say it's $3.50, Marcellus at the margin is a buck eighty and ACO in Canada is under 180. So there's a lot of kind of price incentives to move this gas out. And the exports, by the way, will have a minimal impact on the average domestic US price of natural gas because the Canadian gas will flow in and more production will come up. The other side of it is wh what, what happens to the international market. And this, this is a dynamic international market. So we can, uh, companies like Chenier and others who are gonna be in the LNG export business can only export into a market if the price is right. So the, the market is, except at the margin where there's a buyer who wants to diversify supply and just will do it for diversification's sake, for not price sake, uh, there is a limit which is called the international market price, whatever that might be in a different, in a different market. I won't bore you with the details. It's a vulnerable, semi-vulnerable analytical set of assumptions. I'd be willing to defend them. But I've come to the conclusion that there's really a 650 cap on U.S. natural gas prices. 
And that 650 cap makes it economic to do all the things that uh, I was talking about and then some. So beyond the use of natural gas as a feedstock in pet chems and in, uh, in fertilizers and in paper and in steel and, uh, and cement and other energy intensive industries, all of which have this incredibly cheap feedstock at 650 when the average price of the rest of the world is 50% higher than that. But it also makes the economics of natural gas use in the transportation fleet very, very attractive. So moving from 350, to having a, a relationship of 650 gas and uh, $90 oil or even, I dare say, $80 oil will not change the attraction of using uh, natural gas as CNG or uh, LNG. Uh, so a long-winded answer. But I, I wanted to do the long-winded answer because that's what happens in a market, in a market where you're defanging the political instrument in other countries. Um, and uh, I do have time for three minutes uh, just uh, on an aside. And I owe uh, what I'm about to say to Steve Levine, so I'll, I'll acknowledge it. And there we go. He's acknowledged things that he's uh, adopted from my own arguments. But, uh, the, the world of oil is moving in, into a, a, what I like to call, or he more or less calls, uh, a multipolar system uh, in which there are other competing sources. One, one is the Middle East. Uh, I think uh, because of what I said about the Rentier state and the death knoll of the Rentier state, uh, the Middle East has lost its meaningful position as a place that can guarantee supply or can use a political instrument. Uh, it, it, it no, the old world no longer works for a country in the Middle East. You can't commit to do something that the market says you have no credibility of committing to, uh, nam namely supplying more or supplying less. The other two uh, poles in this business are Russia moving to being a global supplier. Uh, that could have some interesting impact in the Pacific Basin, uh, but Russia will be a price taker essentially. It's not much that it can do. Uh, in this emerging world to use uh, hydrocarbons as an instrument of policy. And the fourth one is China, which one, one of these months, if not already, has taken over the pole position from the U.S. as being the largest uh, importer of crude oil in the world. Um, the stunning thing about, uh, about China and this global market situation is twofold. And most of the world has an analytically has focused on the massive amount of money being spent by Chinese firms to gobble up resources around the world. 85 billion is the run rate for 2013. Um, that's probably not much to be worried about for a whole bunch of reasons. The two th other factors that I want to note, and one I owe entirely to Steve, is that the Chinese authorities have stolen Central Asia from Russia. Uh, and they've done so through pipelines. Uh, and the pipelines are not insignificant. Uh, and I don't know whether I sent this to you, Steve, but I, I got volumetrically with uh, the current monthly data from China on imports by country, so I have the whole spreadsheet. So uh, in their imports of natural gas, they went from nothing from Central Asia to close to 60% of their total imports coming from Central Asia, and they barely begun to tap into uh, the resource base of Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, and Kazakhstan. So it's sort of, sort of uh, I think that's the, the interesting half of the insight into China. The other one is that the, China is one of the two largest incremental buyers of natural gas in the world, the largest incremental buyer of oil in the world. Uh, the Chinese authorities have no truck for political playing around with hypercarbons. And, you know, they, they, they've got the Central Asian countries because they're paying to them a higher price than Gazprom and its stupidity was willing to pay. And it's a lower price than other world market prices. It's a nice sweet spot to be in. If you are the largest incremental buyer of LNG in the world and you are also a, a large producer of natural gas and a large importer of natural gas from Central Asia, and here I put India alongside China, you have no interest whatsoever in perpetrating forever an oil link contract. Uh, and, uh, and they have the assistance of uh, uh, a uh, Japanese economy, which 
will be recommissioning nuclear power plants and which will be releasing natural gas LNG into the market and the type market is bound to become a looser market. So, um, you know, I think on the natural gas price, it's not just that I like that 650 number, uh, and I won't make one more comment on it. I like the 650 number, but I think what's happening in China and uh, the rest of the world hydrocarbon system kind of reinforces that. So um, the other thing I like about the number is that there are companies in the United States, in Canada, uh, in, in some big companies in uh, East Africa and in Australia that are looking at uh, high cost development in today's market and they're praying for the continuation of both high oil prices and an oil index link. And, uh, and I think that uh, as they put a lot of capital into these projects and they bring them on, and as they try to recoup their capital through the capacity charge, which is another way of saying a fictitious accounting principle for amortizing what you've done, that 650 number has embedded in it $3 for uh, capacity charge. In a competitive environment, sunk costs are sunk costs, cash flow is king, and I suspect there will be downward pressure, therefore, on the price. I'm sorry I preempted other questions. In your remarks, um, you mentioned Mexico twice, and you mentioned NAFTA. Um, and we know that, that um, the current um, regime in Mexico is, is aggressively trying to push through its legislative process, um, reform of its oil industry. Um, what are the implications if there is reform and foreigners are able to invest in Mexican companies, Mexico is able to import um, foreign read U.S. technology? What are the micro and macro implications for a Mexico and for the U.S.? Yeah. Um I will try to be brief on the subject. It's certainly not a subject that I haven't thought about. So, uh, uh, so there, there are two stages of reform. One is constitutional, and the other is legislative and regulatory. Uh, the constitutional reform has not happened. It will happen. Uh, there's virtually no doubt about that. It's uh, simple word changing in two articles of the Constitution. They're originally looking at three, but it's two. Uh, and what it does is... Uh, in, a, in, a, uh, in an interesting word change, permits something that otherwise was not permitted. So uh, it deprives the government of an effective monopoly in oil production uh, and, uh, and uh, natural gas, uh, pr uh, oil production and power generation. And, um, and then what happens is going to be a function of either gradual unfolding of regulation or massive unfolding of regulation, and that has a lot to do with a uh, significant amount of political events in, in Mexico. Um, the government has not set out on a good foot in getting this done quickly because it's put, it's proposed massive reforms, uh, including educational reforms, and let me, and this is a little bit cynical, but it's basically the truth. The, uh, if you're a teacher, you're part of a union, and your child inherits your position. So the government is trying to re reform that. Uh, and, uh, you know, there have been strikes that have made it uh, a five hour trip from downtown Mexico City to the airport. Uh, and it's th this kind of disruptive activity is not going to go away. The government has proposed fiscal reform, which is also not insignificant. The government has, about, uh, has just about alienated every constituency in the country that it could possibly alienate. Uh, and that makes the process of legislating uh, reform kind of difficult. And they started in, in the political process by uh, making overtures to uh, the left-wing most resource nationalist party, which has absolutely no influence on legislation. And it ignored the more conservative uh, PAN party without whose support they can get no legislation through. So they, they, they've talked about, uh, it's hard to do this with a straight face, hard to talk, they've talked about putting Pemex on an equal footing with foreign companies or national companies, uh, and then Pemex, like 
whether it's Exxon or Anadarko or Apache, it doesn't matter, or, or the company in Mexico that you and I create, uh, we find something, doing that is another regulatory issue, but once we get the material out of the ground, we have to hand it to a newly created, not yet existing trading company. Uh, and that trading company will, in a transparent way, sell the material and then divide up the rents as between uh, the host country and the country and the companies that were there, irrespective of you know, other things that go into this. This is Mexico that doesn't have a trading company. It does have a professional trading house in Houston, but none that has ever done anything of this scale. There's not the manpower to do it. Uh, and certainly transparency, I think, would not work. So it's, it's sort of the, the initial outline of what they plan to do are all non-starters. Uh, but let's see w what happens. Uh, what will happen almost for sure, and it's not difficult to note this, is reform in the power sector will precede reform, reform in the oil and gas sector, or well, gas is part of it. Uh, the U.S., by the way, and I didn't mention this on the export of LNG side, the U.S. Uh, a year ago was exporting a B and a half a day to Mexico is now exporting two BCF a day. Uh, there are pipelines being built from Texas and, uh, uh, and uh, New Mexico and Arizona to, well, one of those in any in event, to, uh, to, to Mexico that will make capacity, natural gas capacity in the pipelines reach 8 BCF a day by 2018 when Peña Nieto's term of office is over. Um, that is going to power gen, will keep prices down. Uh, and it's going uh, to directly to industry. So there are, there, are, there are a couple of IPP projects with private sector moving the gas, and the pipelines are not monopolized by, uh, by CEFE. They are privately owned, so the tariff is not going to prohibit uh, flow from the U.S. into Mexico, uh, nor will it uh, limit the uh, opportunity by the industrial base of Mexico to use it. So there will be a significant impact on... Mexican electricity prices and on Mexican industry uh, making it, uh, and, and that's part, part of the reform is designed to recoup a lot of the lost competitiveness of, of Mexican industry lost to China uh, in the U.S. market. What happens on the oil side is uh, pretty intriguing. Um, I think volumetrically, they'll get over this hump politically. If they got the constitutional reform in place, they will work something out over time. I think we'll see, uh, and this is part of my own uh, at least internal narrative on uh, production increases in North America. Um, I, I think easily a half a million barrels a day more by 2018 and a million and a half barrels a day more in the early years of the 2020s. So it'll have a palpable impact on uh, a bunch of uh, current account related things in Mexico and Mexican industry, because the industry is the Gulf of Mexico industry, and if I were running, building uh, not sophisticated deep water uh, drilling equipment, but supply things, there's going to be a lot of supply coming out of Mexico, and uh, there should be a lot of employment. And I didn't, we didn't talk about employment. There's a lot of employment associated with all of these things in Canada, the U.S., and Mexico. So we have time for one more? That's it. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure to be with you. I think it is clear how fortunate we are to believe in the power of ideas. Supply the common sense and the fresh thinking of the Manhattan Institute.